PC recording is underway. Cloud recording is underway. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Martinez. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Finance. At this time, would all part panelists please turn on their video to minimize disruption. Please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so uh, via email at the following address. Testimony, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin. Thank you very much, Sergeant Martinez. And to all the sergeants, thank you as well for all the hard work that you do for all of us. Good morning and thank you all for attending today's virtual hearing. I'm council member Daniel Drum and I'm the chair of the finance committee. Uh, I don't have the list of colleagues yet, but I'll get that and I'll announce them momentarily. Today's hearing will focus on three pieces of legislation. Intro 1859, sponsored by Minority Leader Matteo, which would make permanent the expansion of the alternative veterans exemption that the council originally passed in 2017. And two pre-considered introductions sponsored by council members Moya and Chin, which would authorize the council to adopt interest rate relief in fiscal 22 for certain COVID-19 impacted property owners unable to pay their real property taxes on time. Let's start with intro 1859, sponsored by Minority Leader Matteo, which would eliminate the current June 30th, 2022 sunset provision in relation to the expansion of the alternate, alternative veterans exemption that the council originally passed in 2017. In 1984, the state legislature enacted the alternative veterans exemption, which exempts a percentage of assessed value of the primary residence of qualifying veterans or certain members of their family. In 2016, state legislation authorized the city through local law to extend the exemption of the school of the school rate part of the property tax, which the council and the mayor agreed to do as part of the fiscal 2018 budget negotiations. Minority leader Matteo was also a sponsor of that legislation, which passed in June 17. At the time, the council projected that the impact of the legislation would be to add an average savings of $595 per year per veteran household on top of the average existing exemption savings of $545 per year. However, the legislation included a sunset provision of June 30th, 2022. Minority leader Matteo's intro number 1859 proposes to eliminate the sunset provision, thereby making the 2017 changes permanent. I'm going to invite Minority Leader Matteo to speak about his bill. Council Member or Major, Minority Leader Matteo. Thank you, Chair Drum. I appreciate it. Um, four years ago, the City Council passed the Alternative Exemption for Veterans, a bill I sponsored that expanded the prior veteran exemption to include the school portion of property taxes. The alternative exemption is available for veterans who served in a time of war, as well as disabled veterans and Gold Star parents. Currently, about 39,000 veterans and their families take advantage of the veterans alternative exemption, with the median additional savings of $723 off of their tax bills. This financial relief is needed now more than ever, as so many New Yorkers have suffered loss during this pandemic and the consequential economic downturn. However, as part of a compromise with the administration when we pass this legislation, the alternative exemption for veterans is set to sunset next June at the end of fiscal year 2022. I think most of my colleagues would agree that not only is the 40 million the city currently foregoes in property taxes from the alternative exemption for veterans affordable, but absolutely imperative. We could allow the next council to tackle this legislation, but I, but I believe it is our responsibility to ensure this exemption continues to exist as long as our veteran neighbors remain in the city. After all they have given to us and to our country, they deserve it. Thank you, Chair Trump. Thank you very much, Minority Leader Matteo. Let me announce that we have been joined by, uh, obviously, Minority Leader Matteo, Council Members Kostlowitz, Van Bramer, Adams, Powers, Diaz, Brooks Powers, Amphrey Samuel, 
Grudenchik, Moya, Rosenthal, and Lewis. And if others join us, I'll make that announcement later on. Thank you. And next, uh, we have the interest rate relief bills. We're now in our 15th month of the COVID-19 pandemic. The governor has announced he'll relax the remaining restrictions on businesses as soon as we cross his 70% vaccination target, which should be any day now. However, it's important to remember how bad it's been. Almost 109,000 New Yorkers have been hospitalized and more than 33,300 have lost their lives due to COVID-19. The governor's pause shutdown of non-essential businesses unleashed economic shock, shocks that had immediate widespread negative impacts on the city's homeowners and both residential and commercial tenants and property owners. Many property owners experienced a disruption to their incomes and many businesses struggled to make their rent or stay open because of COVID-19. While widespread foreclosures and evictions have thus far been deferred due to federal and state eviction moratoria, there is, mounting, there is a mounting burden of deferred mortgage payments and rents. To understand the scale of the deferred payments, consider that the state is now in the process of distributing $2.7 billion in rental housing assistance provided under the American Rescue Plan Act. But it is estimated that the funds will cover less than 80% of back rent, utilities and late fees owed statewide as of March 21. And that's just residential rent. Many commercial landlords have not been able to collect rent from their commercial tenants either. Shopping centers, hotels, and restaurant, restaurants have been especially hard hit. Each year, the council adopts the interest rates to be applied to the late payment of property taxes to incentivize timely payment, which is essential to keeping the city running because we rely on property tax collections to fund approximately 30% of the city's budget. However, last spring, it became clear that many COVID-19 impacted property owners would have difficulty paying their property taxes on time and that charging regular interest rates on their late payment would be punitive. According to the council, accordingly, the council adopted legislation to set lower late payment interest rates in the first quarter of fiscal 21 for certain properties whose owners had been impacted by COVID-19. Ultimately, only 99 properties in total took advantage of these programs. This year, Councilmember Moya and Councilmember Chin have proposed legislation that would provide the council with authority to again adopt reduced interest rates, but under expanded circumstances and for the entire year to provide targeted relief to property owners who are still struggling as a result of the pandemic. I'm going to invite the sponsors to speak about their bills, hearing first from Council Member Moya and then from Council Member Chin. Council Member Moya. Thank you so much, Chair Drum, and uh, good morning to everyone and my colleagues here. Uh, as you know, new, uh, as New York opens up and people are welcoming back a new normal, we still have many New Yorkers struggling to get back on their feet from food insecurity to rent and mortgage payments. Part of having an equitable recovery is ensuring that we can provide relief to New Yorkers that were hardest hit by COVID. One way is ensuring that homeowners, including those in co-ops, have the opportunity to get relief on interest rates. This bill I'm introducing is for property owners of a dwelling unit in condominiums or a property held in the, in the cooperative form of ownership where such property assessed value is divided by the number of residential dwelling units that is uh, 250,000 or less per unit uh, with an income of 150000 or less. It would apply to property owners or a member of their household who were adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic because they were diagnosed with COVID-19 or sought medical diagnosis or experienced the loss of a primary source of income because of COVID-19 between March 17, 2020 and June 30th, 2021. This relief would ensure the interest rate would be charged, that would be charged, would be 0% for non-payment of taxes on the property due on July 1st, uh, 2021, October 1st, 2021, January 1st, 2022, or April 1st, 2022. COVID, as we all know, has left no one behind on the financial front, and this would provide relief, especially for the communities disproportionately in, in, impacted by this. Uh, and I thank you all, and I hope that you join me uh, in support uh, of this bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Moya. Councilmember Chin. Uh, 
Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Zhang, for allowing me to speak briefly about my legislation. You know, last year we wanted to help mom and pop small property owners who were struggling in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in my district, where a lot of these small property owners are legacy owner, a building that's been owned by generations or buildings that were owned by family associations. In the weeks leading up to the adoption last year, we had a very real concern about cash flow shortage. This year, we are in much better shape after receiving aids from Washington. We need to make sure that people who own and maintain these small properties can also get through the pandemic. Last year, we were able to adopt a 7.5% interest rate for non-payment for our city's property tax uh, for small property owners. For these small properties, we are hoping to have a better reduction in interest rate this fiscal year. And, what, and we wanna give them real support for those who have a large reduction in income uh, as a result of the pandemic. After seeing the effect of last year's program, our goal this year is to create an even wider eligibility range for small property owners. And we're also extending the timeline from one fiscal quarter to the whole year. And my legislation will deal with property um, that are assessed values of over $250,000 in fiscal year 22. Uh, I'm proud of the work that we were able to do last year. And we hope that we can continue uh, to expand and help more small property owners and more New Yorkers. Thank you, Chair Joe. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Chin. We have also been joined now by Council Member Cornegy. Uh, we are also joined by uh, representatives of the Department of Finance, including Jeffrey Shear, Jeff Deputy Commissioner of Treasury and Payment Services, Mary Christine Jackman, Assist Assistant Commissioner, and City Treasurer, and Tim, uh, excuse me, Assistant Commissioner and City Treasurer, and Tim Shear Shearis, Deputy Commissioner of Property. Before we hear their testimony, I will turn it over to our committee council for some procedural announcements and then to swear in the witnesses. Thank you, Chair Drum. My name is Noah Brick and I am counsel to the New York City Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen to your name to be called. We will begin with testimony from the administration, followed by questions from council members. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called upon in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to the administration witnesses, and you will be called on to so affirm at the end. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Mr. Scheer? I do. Ms. Jackman? I do. And I believe we are no longer joined by Mr. Shears. So, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Scheer, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Drum and members of the Committee on Finance. My name is Jeffrey Shear. I am Deputy Commissioner for Treasury and Payment Services for the New York City Department of Finance. I am joined by Mary Christine Jackman, the city's treasurer, who also serves as Finance Commissioner Solomon's representative on and secretary to the New York City Banking Commission. I am here today to testify on two pre-considered council bills that address what interest rate the city should charge the property owners who make late payments on their New York City property taxes in tax year 2022. Property taxes are the city's biggest single source of tax revenue, accounting for $31 billion or nearly half of the city's total tax revenues. Without this revenue, the city would not be able to pay its teachers, its first responders, and its vendors to provide crucial services to New Yorkers. 
This includes the provision of critical goods and services needed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the distribution of hundreds of thousands of meals each day to make sure no one goes hungry. The administration strongly supports the recommendation of the New York City Banking Commission to provide relief to property owners that continue the struggle due to the impact of the pandemic. The Banking Commission balanced this acknowledgement of some struggling property owners with the fact that New York City is on a path to full recovery for all of us. The COVID rate has declined to 1.36%. As of June 10th, 8.6 million vaccinations have been given and 64.2% of adults have received at least one vaccination. More people are returning to offices and retail stores and Broadway begins to reopen later this month with the return of Springsteen on Broadway. As a result, the Banking Commission recommended a program whereby owners of small and mid-sized properties that have been impacted by COVID could have the interest rate on late property tax payments reduced for the first quarter of fiscal year 22. For properties with an assessed value under $250,000, the interest rate would be reduced from the recommended rate of 4.5% to 0%. For properties with an assessed value of over $250,000, the interest rate would be reduced from the recommended rate of 18% to 7.5%. This relief is being recommended even though the late payment interest rate that New York City charges property owners is significantly lower than that charged in other large cities and counties. Attached to this testimony is a graph showing the interest rates of several large cities. The 5% interest rate that New York City currently charges for properties with an assessed value under $250,000 is lower than the interest rate charged by eight other cities. For properties with an assessed value over $250,000, there were three cities that charge a higher rate than the current 18% interest rate, one city that charges the same rate and four cities that charge a lower rate. However, this comparison omits the fact that seven of the eight other cities charge penalties in addition to the interest charges. These penalties are incurred as part of the delinquent accrual process and are not associated with enforcement actions. New York City does not impose penalties on top of interest. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the administration worked with the council last year to provide another measure of relief pursuant to local law 24, which was passed early in calendar 2021. One of the provisions of this bill was to create a third tier of properties to be charged a lower interest rate. For many years, the city has had two late payment interest rates one for properties with an assessed value under 250,000 and another for properties with an assessed value over $250,000. Starting on July 1st, there will be a third category for mid-value properties with an assessed value between $250,000 and $450,000. The Banking Commission has recommended to the Council that this rate for fiscal year 22 should be 12%, reducing by one third the interest that would be charged on these properties for late payments. With all this in mind, we have very strong reservations regarding the two council bills. The bills expand the time period during which interest rate relief would be given from the first quarter of the calendar year to the entire year. They also would greatly expand the number of property owners eligible for relief. For example, the bill pertaining to properties with an assessed value over $250,000 would be available to all class two and all class four owners, including large landlords 
and multinational companies that own properties worth tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Such owners would need to certify that they experienced a 50% drop in income during any six month period going back to March 2020, and they would be charged the interest rate for smaller property owners. 3.25% for the first quarter of fiscal year 22 and 4.5% for the remainder of the year as recommended by the Banking Commission. The city would not have the time nor the resources to review the documentation submitted for accuracy. If many commercial owners and large landlords were to take advantage of what is effectively an offer to borrow money from the city at interest rates that are competitive with commercial loans, the city could suffer a precipitous decline in its cash reserves. These reserves are needed to meet all the fiscal obligations of the city, including, including paying its vendors and making payroll. The expansion of the program is compounded by the length of time that property owners would be given under these bills to apply for such relief. Owners would have until June 15th, 2022 to apply for such relief. That means the city would not know the scope of the program and its impact on cash reserves um, until that date. Such a long time frame is not necessary because COVID impacted owners know today whether they need this relief. There also is the potential for much confusion regarding the actual liability of these properties for such an extended period. For example, our standard payment plans require owners to keep current with the accrual of new charges on a monthly or quarterly basis. A property with partial payments may not seem current early in the year, but if it applied for interest relief by next June, that could dramatically affect its status after the fact. In addition, it may be difficult for owners who pay no property taxes in FY22 to pay two years worth of taxes in fiscal year 23. Finally, the length of the program combined with the extended application time would make this program very difficult for DOF to administer. Making interest adjustments for potentially thousands of properties at different intervals is not a process to which the department could easily adapt. As we noted, the administration supports lower interest rates in the first quarter of fiscal year 22 to aid in the recovery, but bills that would ostensibly enact such a large relief program that could imperil the city's cash reserves send the signal that we are taking a step backwards at exactly the time that the city's economy is ramping up. In fact, overall, the city's delinquency rate on property taxes is up slightly this year, 2.4% compared to the same time last year, 2.1%. We look forward to continuing conversations on what the council intends to propose as recommendations for interest rates. For the 2021-2022 tax year, the Banking Commission has recommended that property owners with an assessed value under 250,000 pay a 3.25% rate for the first quarter and 4.5% rate for the remainder of the year. The Commission also has recommended a late payment interest rate of 12% for property owners with an assessed value over $250,000 and under $450,000, and 18% for property owners with an assessed value over $450,000. The New York City Administrative Code requires that DOF charge default interest rates if the council does not act timely. These rates are 7% for property owners with an assessed value under $250,000, 13% for property owners with an assessed value between $250,000 and $450,000, and 15% for property owners with an assessed value over $450,000. Lastly, regarding intro 1859,
the department supports the continuation of applying the alternative veterans exemption for wartime and combat veterans to the portion of the property tax levied for school purposes. Beginning July 1st, 2017, the exemption has been allowed for the school portion of the property tax. Introduction 1859 prevents this provision from expiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Minority Leader Mario in one minute, but we have uh, been joined also by Council Member Yeager. Uh, Minority Leader Mario, you have questions right now. I appreciate, um, I appreciate that, Chair Drum. Um, Deputy Commissioner, thank you. Good to see you. Um, I'm focusing on, on the last paragraph of your uh, testimony right now. Uh, yes. For my uh, intro 1859, you know, in a perfect world four years ago, we wouldn't have, we, we would have not included a sunset clause, but that was part of the negotiations to pass the bill. So um, it was not something I wanted, but something that we needed to pass the bill at the time. Um, so I'm, I'm extremely pleased to see that the department supports uh, the continuation of the veterans exemption. So I just have some few questions for the record. Um, as we move forward to to pass this bill and to um, get rid of the sunset. Um, so in my in my opening statement, I said that there's about 39,000 veterans um, and their families should take advantage of the exemption about $723 off of their tax bills and about 40 million total. Do you uh, do you agree with that? Are your numbers the same? Um, my numbers are, are similar, but slightly different. So I'm going to um, review them. Okay. Uh, bear with me one moment. Sure. So uh, I'll start with the numbers. So our numbers as of May 25th is a total of 37,103 veterans receiving the exemption. Okay. And uh, I have a borough breakdown, Please. Um, which I believe has also been requested. Yep. So in Manhattan, the number is 3,337. In the Bronx, the number is 2,962. <coughs> in Brooklyn, the number is 7,533. Mm -hmm. In Queens, the number is 14,844. And in Staten Island, the number is 8,427. Our figures indicate that the average value of the benefit in fiscal year 21 um, is $1,112. $1,112, you said? Yes. Okay and that the um, total value of the exemption in fiscal year 2021 is $43.7 million. Okay, and, and getting rid of the sunset wouldn't change that total. Right. Right, okay. Um, do you know the average age of, of anyone receiving the exemption? We do not have that information. Okay, if you can get it to us, I'd appreciate it. Um, is every council member? I, I don't believe that um, in applying that we um, require it. age. Okay, but, uh, but we will double check that. All right, and get if back you, if you have it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so when we we passed it, you know, it, it was a lot of outreach. I just want to, just for the record, can you tell me um, what kind of outreach uh, DOF does to um, um, let veterans know about the exemption? Yes. So DOF's main approach in terms of constituent outreach is through our external affairs outreach unit. So our team partners with elected officials such as yourself um, and um, other networks to conduct seminars and events to disseminate information regarding um, exemptions elig eligibility. That's um, for all exemptions, including um, and especially the additional veterans exemption. Um, and we include in that outreach any change in eligibility re requirements um, so that we can solicit um, as many um, eligible new applicants as we can. And 
are, are there renewals for the exemption? So, or is it, if, if, if you just have it, you, you're just gonna continue to have it. They don't have to do anything else. Obviously we're just getting rid of the sunset here. So we're not really changing anything in terms of the actual uh, substance, substance of the bill, but just getting rid of the sunset. So um, I'd assume that that would stay the same. Yes. So unlike some other exemptions, there is no statutory renewal, renewal requirement for to retain the veterans exemption once people um, show that they are qualified. And so it, it's up to, is that, I guess my question is, is everyone who's qualified for the exemption get the exemption? Do you know? Uh, as far as I know, they do. Okay. As long as they apply. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to just follow up with, with your office on that um, as well, because as we move to pass this bill and get rid of the sunset, obviously uh, it will be um, more veterans will, will, will see it again um, because of our outreach. So I just wanna make sure that everyone who is entitled to the exemption will get it. So um, I, I appreciate um, the department support on this. I think it's extremely important that we do not leave this um, to the next council, the next administration that we act now. So uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate the support, Chair Drum. I appreciate your support as always. Um, and I will send it back to you. Thank you. Well, and um, talk, um, representing the administration, um, we support your leadership on the issue, minority leader Matteo. And, and we also appreciate working with the entire council um, in our outreach efforts. Um, you help us um, outreach better. Um, you know how to outreach to people. Um, when we work together in partnership, that's um, the best possible outreach. Absolutely. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Commissioner. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. I have a few questions, and then we, I think we have some council members as well. Uh, last year, only 61 people participated in the COVID reduced interest rate program for homeowners, and 38 people participated in the one for smaller commercial and rental buildings. Why did the Banking Commission recommend that we do these programs again, even though they had such a low take up rate? Thank you, Chair Drum. We implemented this program last year with the council, knowing that many people were impacted by COVID, but without knowing how many property owners would need this particular program. We think it is important to retain this program for one more year regardless of its size. And we must keep in mind that many policies and programs were implemented at the federal, state, and local level to address the wide ranging impacts of the pandemic and the numbers of people helped by each policy and program varied significantly. So why do you think uh, the take up rate was so low? Well, for owners of lower valued properties, the amount of the benefit is low. This can be seen by looking at a typical tax bill of $5,000 a year for a tax class one property or condominium. The amount of deferred taxes for one quarter is $1,250. The amount of interest that accrues over one quarter at 3.25% interest is a little more than $10. However, before we look at increasing the amount of the benefit, we must keep in mind that forgiving interest is a necessary but inefficient tool because it addresses one segment of the population, property owners compared to the American Rescue Plan Act, for example, which supply direct relief to every person from moderate income families and because of the way it leverages the delay in property tax dollars received. In this example, the city had a delay in its receipt of $1,250. For every dollar of benefit, the city's cash flow is impacted 125 times more. The more the benefit is increased, the bigger the hit on city cash flow. That being said, DOF acknowledges two factors that could have impact it, impacted the take up rate last year. One is that local laws establishing the program were passed last June after DOF already had mailed property tax bills that were due on July 1st. 
many owners already had remitted payments in advance of the July 1st due date. The other factor is that DOF focused on how to quickly process the applications it received by allowing them to be uploaded directly into our property tax system. As a result, applications were processed in days. The need to quickly and properly process applications did not give us sufficient time to publicize the program as much as we would have liked. So can you tell me a little bit about what you did do in terms of advertising the availability of the program last year? Yes. So DOF developed a prominent web page um, on its website last year that included uh, the link for the online application and explained in detail all of the um, eligibility requirements. Um, we also integrated integration about the program into our property owner outreach efforts um, that cover such things as exemptions and property tax payment plans. This is the same outreach unit that I was describing a few minutes earlier um, to minority leader Matteo, um, which we use to um, let owners know about exemptions such as the additional veterans exemption. We immediately made sure that um, our presentations included information on the program. So do you see uh, any problems with this year's proposal, um, which would require um, informing late payers with an assessed value, I think of about 250,000 or less of um, the reduced interest rate program? So DOF is amenable to notifying late payers with an assessed value under $250,000 of the existence of the program. This could be done more effectively and efficiently with a separate mailing to those owners rather than trying to include it in the second quarter property tax bill. The property tax bill already includes a lot of information, so any publicity about this program could easily get lost. Furthermore, it would be difficult to customize the bills of just the owners who are late in making payments. We would send a special letter before the second quarter property tax bills. So are you saying once you know who's late, is that when you know by the second bill? So um, we would wait a certain period after the first bill is paid. Uh, so probably about halfway that the bills are spaced three months apart. So roughly six weeks or so after the, the first bill was due, if it wasn't paid, we would send a separate notification to everyone who was late at that point to A, inform them that they are late and B, to advise them of the existence of this program. Um, we think that would be uh, a more effective and efficient way to let um, these owners know about the program rather than trying to wait um, the full three months and um, having it as one more item uh, in our um, property tax bill. Okay, thank you, got it. Um, and I just wanna remind folks that 250,000 in assessed value does not mean market value um, for folks that are listening out there. Uh, last June, the administration was very concerned about the potential impact of late payment of property taxes on the city, uh, on the city's rather tight cash flow. And we mentioned that a little bit before and uh, was therefore hesitant to make the COVID hardship programs too broad. So given the influx of federal relief and other changed factors, how would you characterize the cash flow situation this year? So currently the city's cash reserves are at $11 billion. So they are high as of today. However, during the course of the fiscal year, they vary quite a lot. And we do expect them to be um, dropping by July 1st, um, I believe to $4 billion. And I'm going to ask um, the city's treasurer, um, Mary Christine Jackman, to talk about how they are expected to decline further during the fiscal year 
before they increase again. Thank you. Good morning, um, Chair Jum. The um, we're expecting that the cash flow reserves, the cash reserves are going to decrease quite substantially. Right now we are at 11 billion, but there's 7 billion going out in the next two weeks that we know of for sure. And that's not including anything that people have forgotten to notify us about. We expect it to be approximately 4 billion by the time we get to July 1st, but the low point for the year is always um, end of November, beginning of December. And right now we're anticipating that it'll only be about 1 billion, 1 billion and a half at that point, um, which, which makes it difficult to meet all of our obligations and to stay on top of it. How does that fit in historically? Has that um, been the case? 2019, 2019, the balance was 2.47 billion and uh, tw or 2.2, Nine seven billion, and then in 2020, it was 2.397. And what did you say that it would take it down to one? One, we're, we're estimating about one and a half billion. Mm -hmm. So a little lower, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sure. Um, is the administration supportive of extending the reduced interest rates? I heard in your testimony that you had deep concerns. Um, can you elaborate further on that, uh, Deputy Commissioner? Yes, we do not think it wise to extend the program beyond the first quarter of the fiscal year. The city's economy is in recovery and the temporary program is needed as we transition. But we do not need the program to last for the full fiscal year. Also, there could be unintended consequences for owners who delay paying their property taxes for one full year and then would be required to pay two years worth of taxes in fiscal year 23. We know that many owners have taken advantage of our monthly billing option because regular billing helps them manage their budget. Some owners may find it difficult to resume prop paying property taxes after not paying for a year. Our experience with temporary programs is having a long application period does not necessarily increase participation. So um, we only had 99 people um, participate last year. Are you worried also that if you were to extend it, you would see uh, greater participation at a higher cost? Um, I think when the the greater length of time and the entire um, fiscal year, when that's combined with the eligibility, which would be open um, for uh, under one provision, um, all class two and class four property owners um, who declare um, a loss of income, that, that potential there concerns us. We definitely um, want to engage in the dialogue with the council about potential expansion along the lines of um, broadening eligibility um, regarding um, assessed value cutoff, for example, or number of units, which were um, two of the criteria that were used last year. Um, but we are concerned about having a program that is um, eligible to all um, and that extends for the entire fiscal year. And that includes co-ops, that's one of your concerns? So for co-ops, um, we definitely want to engage in a dialogue with the council on co-ops. Um, um, and we think that co-ops can be folded into the programs. Um, one challenge to consider is that reduced interest would accrue to the entire co-op building and um, not to the individual shareholders who are impacted by COVID. But we definitely are open to having a conversation to include co-ops in the program. Okay, thank you, good. Uh, let me go back to, um, to Mary Christine Jackman, if I may, just to ask, um, why do you expect the um, cash flow 
to be at about one point, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting 1.1 or 1.2, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, dollars. We're, we're expecting it to be, Chair John, we're expecting it to be less because of, um, we're expecting slower payment this year based on a number of the programs that are available. And we're, we're also expecting um, the, that the payments that we do receive will be on lower assessed values. Does cash flow um, include what's collected in personal income taxes? The, the cash flow includes everything that comes into the city. So everything's included in there in some manner, shape or form. So it's my understanding that personal income taxes are at a much higher rate than, um, than was what was originally expected. Does that factor into um, your decision or your concern about it dropping to one point? <laughs> what, what exactly is the number? I'm keep forgetting. <laughs> One and a half billion. Let's let's one just use one. Billion. Let's use one and a half billion. Um, remember, that's a projection, and yes, yes, it is factored in. We're we're just concerned because remember, over half of the um, incoming money is property taxes. That's mm -hmm. that's over half of it. So that's it. What happens with property taxes definitely definitely affects the overall cash flow. Okay. Right. Uh, I, I would just want to add that um, Mary Christine and her team do um, constantly update the projections so that um, when there are developments, so for example, as you mentioned, Chair Drum, if um, personal income taxes are running higher than expected, um, that's folded in. Um, we tend to see um, developments in both directions. So what can happen is that revenue may be higher for one tax and may be lower for another tax or um, spending may be higher uh, than expected. So um, it is traditional based on the ebbs and flows that um, December 1st it tends to be the low point of the year. And we do have to make sure that at that point that we have sufficient um, reserves to um, meet the city's payroll. And so are you basically saying you expect the property taxes to be lower and the personal income tax to be higher? That, that's factored, that is factored into it, yes. But, but we are very focused on and very concerned about the property taxes. Okay. All right, thank you. I know that uh, Council Member Chin has some questions. We're gonna to go to her. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, thank you, um, Commissioner. I I know last year we were able to, you know, bring the um, the late payment interest rate down to seven and a half percent. I mean, knowing the property owners, I mean, even the small property owners in my district, I mean, they've struggled, and everybody they want to pay the tax because they don't want to lose the building. They don't want the building to be on lien sale. And these are buildings that's been in families for generation or, you know, or family association that people have contributed their hard earned money uh, to purchase the building. And they don't want to sell. And speculators are, are calling them every other day. So we have to give them some relief. And the way the property tax system is not fair to begin with. Uh, so last year we were only able to do it for one quarter. And as you mentioned, you know, a lot of people probably didn't even know about the program and weren't able to take advantage of it. And that's why we're proposing to at least extend it for the whole year um, so that people can have, you know, sufficient time um, to be able to help them. Um, so my question to you is that when you were talking about the delinquent rate, it's not that many. So we're really talking about helping people who really need the help. I don't think property owner is gonna, you know, intentionally not pay their tax. Uh, and, and looking at the interest rate, I mean, they don't wanna pay more. So, I mean, we're helping people who are really, you know, in dire need so that we don't put the burden on them. Before it was 18%. That was a lot to add on, you know, to the tax for late payment. And so I think my question is like, why not extend it for the year? Uh, 
And and since it's, it's not a big, uh, it's not a big chunk of our property tax, right? The delinquent payment. So so we're still getting the, the property tax that that we need. So what, what's the hesitation on the administration's part? Thank you, council member. So first, I do want to be clear that we agree with you that there are property owners that need relief. And this is why we have proposed um, low interest rates to begin with, interest rates that are lower than in other cities. And this is why we work with you and the council to create this third tier that charges a much lower interest rate for property owners with an assessed value between two hundred and fifty and four hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, and I would like to say um, I agree with your statement that um, there are owners who are struggling, and we want to work with you to um, best target this program to those owners. We are concerned about having eligibility that is too broad. And I must emphasize that when we process the applications for this program, we really do so on the honors basis. We don't have the time um, if an owner declares that they need the help um, and they um, do not qualify to be able to, to withhold that, that help. Uh, and we do, again, remain concerned that um, property owners at the time that we are um, recovering from the pandemic um, would be uh, enticed to withhold payments for a full year and then face the prospect of having to pay two years worth of property taxes in the following fiscal year. So again, we, we share your concern and we want to work with you like we did last year um, to create a bill that balances the need to, to help those who are struggling um, along with the concerns about being um, overly broad. What, what is the percentage uh, of the property tax that the city collect are, are owners that have late payment? Do we have an idea? Yes. So. In this year, it's um, the most recent information we have is it's 2.4% um, compared to 2.1% in the previous year. Okay, so it's, it's still a very small percentage. So I yes, don't think property is. owner is going to intentionally hold back the money and then cure the interest rate, which is still higher than going to a bank. I, yeah, that, that doesn't really make sense to me. I mean, we're just trying to help people who are struggling and let's simplify the process so they can get the help that they need. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do because they're struggling. I mean, like a lot of them are not getting rent payment. Uh, and the property tax every year goes up. I mean, that's the biggest complaint that I hear from constituents, especially small property owner. The property tax keeps going up and they're not, and they're not collecting rent. And uh, so we're just trying to see what we can do to, to help them at least a bit so that they can recover at the same time that the city is recovering. And the banking commission, I guess one of the questions is like, I think the banking commission, now they're making a recommendation about this new tier from 250 to 450 at a 12% rate. How did they come up with that? Um, so let me address you, your first question, council member, and I want to acknowledge that you have been an active and effective um, advocate for um, small business owners and small property owners, and we really want to work with you and the council um, to create a, a more targeted program. We share your goals of, of trying to um, assist those owners. With regard to the, um, the third tier to create a lower interest rate for um, mid-value properties. That is something we worked on um, with the council 
So the third tier that's, that was recommended by the Banking Commission is actually required by Local Law 24 of 2021. Um, so that law um, created that new third tier and the Banking Commission was required to make a recommendation for the late payment interest rate for that tier. The 12% rate is still very high. So I, I just think that we, we need to work together and, and find a way um, to help these smaller property owners um, that we're talking about who are still struggling. And um, until we have a better property tax system, which the bank, you know, the property tax commission is like hearing, having hearings across the borough and we're, we wanted to also, you know, see what their recommendation and make recommendation that they got it really take care of some of these small property owners who are lumped together with a bigger property owner and they haven't been getting any relief. Uh, council member, we look forward to working with you on this bill, on both of these bills, I should say. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Joe. Thank you. And I know that uh, Councilmember Brooks Powers has questions. Thank you so Hi, uh, thank you so much. And thank you for all of the remarks that have been made uh, thus far. I just wanted to ask a question for clarification in terms of the protections um, for the uh, for the property taxes, if it would be benefiting property owners who may have property um, in terms of residential property that is valued at more than 250,000. And why I ask that question is because in particular parts of my district, there are homes um, that range from 500,000 or $600,000 um, in property value and just wanting to understand if they would be included in the, the bills that are being discussed today. Um, thank you, council member. That's an excellent question. It, it relates to something that Chair Drum said earlier um, and, I, and I wanted to speak to, so I'm very glad that, that you brought it up. So it's very important when we are discussing these bills to um, emphasize the difference between assessed value which is a concept that's used for um, property taxes versus market value. So when it comes to class one properties, which I believe um, represent the, the properties that, that you're concerned about with your question, the Department of Finance's um, target rate in terms of the, the ratio of the assessed value to the market value is 8%. So a property that's assessed at $250,000 is uh, actually has a market value of around $4 million. So um, I, is that clear? <laughs> yeah, I, I, so um, the- Yeah, the I'm sorry, I was trying to get off mute. Yes, so what you're saying is the, the amount that's in the legislation is not um, for the market value, it's the assessed value. That is correct. Um, okay. And so the, the bill that covers um, properties with assessed values that are $250,000 and under would cover um, practically all class one um, homes. Great, thank you for that clarification. You're welcome and thank you for asking the question. Okay, thank you. Um, let me ask a couple of more questions. Um, this year for the first time, the council's authorized to adopt a third late payment interest rate for properties with assessed values between 250 and 450,000. How many properties fall into this category and what type of properties are they? Thank you. So there are 36,000 properties that fall within this range, Chair Drum. Of that number, 
1,000 of those properties are class one properties. 24,000 of them are class two properties and 11,000 of them are class four properties. They represent um, nearly 40% of the properties that have uh, an assessed value over $250,000. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, and the DOF commissioner is entrusted to set uh, the interest rates charged when business taxes are not paid on time is currently set at 7.5% and has been that way since July 1, 2020. In the past 20 years, the interest rate has not exceeded 10%. So how did DOF um, decide on the current 7.5% rate for business taxes? The interest rate for business taxes is determined by the administrative code. It is equal to the federal short-term rate plus seven percentage points. The okay, late payment, go ahead. I was gonna say, what's the delinquency rate on business taxes and how does that compare to investor-oriented properties like class two rentals or uh, class four commercial properties? The DOF has not computed a delinquency rate for business taxes um, that takes into account both voluntary payments received with tax returns and late payments. However, we do know that our collection rate on business tax warrants is well under 50%. With business taxes, entities that cease operations and have no assets are not expected to pay outstanding tax liabilities. With property taxes, however, the physical property and its value as an asset continues to exist regardless of the owner's status. The delinquent taxes remain and must be paid even, as pay even if payment is delayed until the property is sold. Okay, let me just go back to what we were talking about before. For the class two properties, what is the average unit count? I'm sorry, for the, the class two properties in this middle tier or, yeah. or over? Uh, I don't have that with me, but we will get back to you with that information. Okay, we'll follow up with you on that. And um, What's the rationale for having lower interest rate for business taxes as compared to property taxes? Yes. So as you've heard, property taxes constitute a major share of the revenue of municipal budgets, not only in New York City, but around the country. This is reflected in the fact that not only New York, but other major cities charge high interest rates on late property tax payments. The reason for these high rates is to drive voluntary compliance. It should be noted that additional penalties are assessed on top of interest for late business tax payments, whereas no penalties are assessed for late property tax payments. And I also want to add that even though the interest rates are high for New York and elsewhere, that the purpose of the high rates is not for revenue purposes. Um, it's rather to ensure the high level of voluntary compliance with property taxes. Margaret Chin and I might argue differently, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, thank you for, for that testimony. I don't have, uh, so let me just ask, when you add in the, um, the late uh, payments, um, When you add in the late penalties for business taxes, what is the net interest charge? Uh, I will get back to you uh, with that. Okay. The, the way the penalties are calculated or, or um, calculated a little, a little differently. So we will come back to you with detailed information on how the, the penalties are created um, and if necessary, provide a, a scenario um, so you could see what the, um, in a, the effective um, percentage would be. Okay, thank you. All You're right, I'm, um, thank you for coming in and for giving testimony today. We do have a member of the public who would like to testify. So I'm going to go to that uh, in a moment. Uh, but again, thank you for coming in and we'll follow up with our questions. And thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you, Council Members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackman, also.
Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day. You too. Uh, Chair Drum, the member of the public has in fact signed off. So with no council members with their hands up and no members of the public, you can close the hearing if you wish. Okay, I so wish. And therefore I'm going to say that this meeting is adjourned at 1140 in the morning. Thank you very much to everyone for coming. Thank you. <laughs>